Jesus' name, I've prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Please, let's be seated. And as you sit down with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. As we look at, for this month's family forum, we want to look at the Christian difference. The Christian difference. The chorus writer says, there's a great change since I'm born again. Because the Christian is different from the non-Christian. As the saint is different from the sinner. The Christian is different from everybody else. The Christian experience is different from any other experience, higher than any other experience, regardless of how valuable that experience may be. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is, not will be, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, you can see it. All things have become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And all things are of God. And all things are of God. It's like what he's trying to say, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. It's, it's, try, it's like he's telling us, which is what he's saying, really, that the salvation of Christ has taken us back to Genesis chapter 1. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. That something has been taken off and replaced and is brand new and you can see it. The believer in Christ Jesus is a unique individual. He draws so much semblance to Christ that the people in Antioch called him Christian. The believer in Christ is a unique individ individual. She draws so much semblance to Christ that the people in Antioch called her Christian. There is a difference between someone saved and the sinner. There is the difference between someone filled with the Holy Spirit and the one filled with the spirit of the world. The Christian is sealed at birth, and this is what creates the difference. The owner, the father of the Christian, seals the son at the time of recreation, new creation. Is sealed at the time of birth, the spiritual birth, with the Holy Spirit, and that person becomes a child of God. He is no longer a regular person. He's not a regular person anymore. His life is hidden with Christ in God. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us about this ceiling. In verse 13, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye had ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 uh, tells us, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are. It's not something that leaves you. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. 
chapter 1, they were sealed. Chapter 4, they are still sealed. And when you get to the last verse of Revelation 22, you are still supposed to be sealed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it tells us about this continuous sealing. Chapter 1, in verse 20, verse 21. Now he which established us with you in Christ. Please observe that phrase, in Christ. Now he which established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. Who had also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. Colossians 3, verse 3. Now the hiding. He seals you and hides you. He treasures us. For ye are sealed, so, sorry, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Have you ever thought of the believer? That you are so special to God, he makes special covering, a special uh, a provision to secure you for himself. No devil can touch you. It's only you that can forfeit your own mercy. Jonah said uh, that they that observe lying vanities... Forsake their, mer their own mercies. You see, the Christian is different. Life pursuits and pleasures are changed once you're born again. The life of grace is focused on eternity. The difference is rooted in the fact that you are in Christ. The difference is noted in the family. The difference is noted in the society. The difference is noted in the church. The church. And so, you have to be sure, as you listen to all the things that have been said today, that you are in Christ. You have to be sure. That indeed you are in Christ. So what is it to be in Christ? Because to be in Christ is the greatest attainment a man can achieve in this life. He says in a leading text, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, you can see it, all things are become what? New. So, what it means to be in Christ is that first of all, your sins are forgiven you, you are washed, and you are baptized, you are put into. It's not just that you have one feet inside Christ. You have one toe inside Christ, one, one hand inside Christ, one part of your life, one sector, one area of your life inside Christ. No, you are immersed, baptizo. You are put inside Christ. When once you have, you have confessed and forsaken your sin, and regeneration has come, and the Lord has moved in, it moves into you, it takes you into God. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Did you see that in Christ there? Mark that phrase. Which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. When once you are born again, you no longer walk after the flesh. The flesh doesn't rule you doesn't control you, doesn't direct you. 
you don't depend on the wisdom of the flesh. You depend on the spirit of God. You walk by the spirit. You walk in the spirit. You walk by faith. You walk in love. In Galatians chapter uh, 3 verse 26. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith. What is the phrase? In Christ Jesus. By faith. Inside Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized, put into, baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Amen. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Everybody goes through the same salvation through Christ. There is neither born nor free. There is neither male or female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of us were all one in Christ Jesus? Praise the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, recall that passage talking about the gift of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. That body is called Christ. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit in Christ. That's what it is to be in Christ. And as you'll notice these passages, the conclusion that you are expected to draw is that we have a common focus. Is that we are different from the world, but within us, among us Christians, because we have the same Father, and we resemble the same Lord, and we represent the same uh, Master, we have a common goal, a common pursuit, and our desires and uh, likings and lovings and longings are similar. And that's why no schism is expected in the body. The Christian difference is like a difference between light and darkness, between day and night, between water and a rock. Yes, between water and ice. The material may be the same. But they are essentially different. Totally different. Praise the Lord. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 15, for in Christ, for in Christ, notice that phrase I, I emphasize again. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availed anything, nor uncircumcision, but, tell me, a new creature, a new creation, praise the Lord, a new creation, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ, to all the saints inside Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, praise the Lord. In Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? First Peter chapter 5, verse 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 14, 1, 4. It says in verse 14, greet ye one another with the keys of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. The peace that Peter is confirming on the church is a peace that is in every child of God. For blessed are the peacemakers. 
They shall be called, tell me their name, the children of God. Praise the Lord. The believer is in the kingdom of light. Sinners are in the kingdom of darkness. The only sphere where Satan rules. And I want to point this out because some believers, the way they talk about Satan is like in their mindset, in their thinking. Satan operates in the kingdom of light. No, Satan does not. Satan operates in the kingdom of darkness. God, the almighty God, my father, your father, the Lord Jesus Christ, they operate in the kingdom of light and rule over the kingdom of darkness. Darkness always submits to light. Darkness always submits to light. If you are in darkness, you can ask the Lord to turn on the light and the darkness will disappear. If the Lord is there with his light, you cannot turn on darkness. Hello? Are you still here? If you don't understand what I'm saying, go to Mount Carmel. And you see the servant of God say, okay, this is how we're going to differentiate. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. And the people that have been worshipping Baal, they've been operating with the spirit of Satan all this while. They've been doing all kinds of things with that power and quote, quote unquote, succeeded. But with the authority of God on the mountain, with the man of God standing there, darkness cannot operate. And so they prayed and prayed and caught their bodies up. And Elijah even helped counsel them. Maybe he's sleeping. Shout louder to wake him up. Maybe he's traveling. And they did all kinds of things. Jumped on the altar. There was no fire. Why? Light was turned on. They could not turn on darkness. And so the fire came down from heaven. And the people shouted, the Lord, he is God. Praise the Lord. And so Satan is not ruler in the kingdom of light. God and Christ are in control of both kingdoms. And so life is different in each kingdom. When you're operating with instruments of darkness, like anger or malice or, you know, carnality, you're not operating with instrument of light. When you're operating like that, you cannot be a difference that the world should see. But the Lord wants all his children to be light in the world because the world is dark. Life is different in each kingdom. The saints are better off than the sinners because they are in, king, in the kingdom of light that has power over the kingdom of darkness. Let's look at three things quickly. Number one, universal picture of a Christian. We're looking at the Christian difference. Universal picture of a Christian. Number two, we, look at, we will look at the unique practice of a Christian. Everything we do is unique, it's different. The way we eat, we are not gluttonous. The things we do, the places we go to, our relationship with money is different from the way the world relates 
with money. Un unique practice of a Christian. Our families are different. The relationship in our families different from the world. Our children don't fight like the children that are in the, the family that is in darkness. The love within, clean, pure love. We want each other, we miss each other just uh, uh, because, you know, we are away from each other for work for just a few hours of the day. That's the Christian family. It's different from the non-Christian family. Even if they are materially richer than the Christian family. There's more joy in the Christian family than the worldly family. The rich, the wealthy, the so-called upper class family. <laughs> They're only upper class here. When the rapture takes place, we will know who is upper class. Because it will be the one that will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Not with a private jet. To meet the Lord in the air. Their private jet can't, go to, can't get into space. You know that, right? <laughs> the ones that will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, that's upper class. Amen? That's real upper class. Make sure you're there. Amen? And then finally, we will conclude with the unequivocal promise to all Christians. Universal picture of a Christian. Universal picture of a Christian. The scripture tells us, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It's different. The one in Christ. Many people in the church are not in Christ. When you are not in Christ, the flesh still pushes you around. When you are not in Christ, anger is a common practice. When you are not in Christ, discrimination that our teachers were talking a lot about today, when you are not in Christ, all kinds of things, worldliness and all. You're arguing about doctrine. You're arguing about everything. You complain. Everything, nothing pleases you. When you're not in Christ, and it's a time of uh, uh, pestilence and uh, trouble and persecution that sometimes exposes some religious people who are not in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things, how many things? All things are become new. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to look at uh, another passage, Titus chapter 2, that we had touched on a little earlier. Praise the Lord. So turn with me quickly there because what the Lord has been trying to do since we got here this morning, the Lord was holding up the picture of a Samaritan. A Samaritan man who was not afraid to take risk to help somebody that was different from him. And this uh, broken man, this person beaten up, beaten up and left to die, is generally thought to have been a Jew. And the priests and the Levites, when they looked over, they did not look over with desire to help. They looked over with just to check, is it my immediate family? No, it's not. Is it my tribal person? No, it's not. Does it look like as educated as myself? No, it's not. Okay, I'm free to go. They were not looking to see if their services are required. And so the Lord puts up this picture to show how that Praise the Lord. They were not looking with a desire to see which or how much of their service we required of them. 
In Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to how many people? All men. That's why we are calling this first point universal picture of a Christian. <laughs> the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to, tell it out loud, everybody, all of mankind. So you, you have no excuse to say the other person is allowed to be a more serious Christian, holier than you, because, oh, he's been given more grace. No, it's available to you too. And, and you know, your grace increases as you increase in obedience. Grace does not abound towards the disobedient. Yes, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What that means is that whatever sin the sinner committed, if he turns to Christ, there's sufficient grace to bring him in. Do you understand? He's not saying that uh, the Lord is going to supply the sinner grace to continue in sin. Because he asks, shall we continue in sin? And then the answer is written down. God forbid. Right? Praise the Lord. And so he says that for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, that same grace has appeared to all men. The perfect picture of Jesus Christ is revealed in the scriptures. Jesus came to show how man can live in the world sinless and to offer all humanity a way to that sinless life. The scripture holds up Christ. As we see Christ hold up the Samaritan. And to say this is the example of how you ought to live. Grace brings salvation. But grace does not leave you after salvation. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. It is available to everybody. It says that we are saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works, tell me, lest any man should boast. How does it work? Jesus showed us, because we're talking about new creation. So we go to John chapter 3. New, brand new creation. Let's look at the principles in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 3. We look at the principles, and then in verse 5, it gives us the procedure or the process. The principles in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto the Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again. Unless there is that regeneration, you can't, it doesn't occur to you how the kingdom appears, neither can it uh, appear to you how to enter it. You don't see it. If you, if you don't see it now, you will not see it later. And so, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be regenerated, be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Pr uh, principles, verse 5, now procedure, all process. Jesus answered, verily, because Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? 
Verily I say unto you, unto thee, except a man be born of water, the word of God, and of the spirit. The spirit uses the word of God to convict and bring to conversion, regenerating a new man, a new heart, a new, a fresh soul. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Until that is done, you are not eligible the physical body, you're not going to grow taller. Your complexion is not going to change from brown to white or to any other color or vice versa. You're still going to look the same, but in the spiritual realm, there's a mark on you that tells the whole world you belong to Christ. There's a mark on you that tells your fellow man you belong to Christ. When you talk, they will hear that you are now a servant of Christ, of the Lord. Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. This is the man that has consciously departed from sin, that takes that acknowledges his sin and makes and tells the Lord, help me, I'm tired of sinning. And the Lord in mercy draws him. The Lord in mercy gives him the grace to cry out for life. And death is passed away from him. And true life, real life, new life now comes, which is grateful to God. Psalm 26, uh, verse 4. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evil doers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O God, O Lord. Praise the Lord. That's the person that has come to Christ and has acknowledged his sins and the sins are forgiven and he makes a commitment, a vow, a covenant with the Lord that he will not go back to the old life but will readily daily live in the light of the new. And that's the person that our text says Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Praise the Lord. Now then, now then, what's the outcome? What's the purpose? Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you, as though God is begging you, as though God is pleading with you, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus he is the source of all needed grace. Wherever you are, you've never been born again before. Wherever you are, you're backslidden. You can't feel him anymore. You turn to the right, it's not there. To the left, it's not there. The back is empty. You go forward. You can't run into him. Today, today, if you hear his voice, the grace is available for you. You can come back. He came in unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, 
to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. What's the last phrase there in that verse 14? Full of what? Grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Verse 16. And of his fullness have all we received. Universal picture of a Christian. And of his fullness have all we received. And of his fullness, tell me, as of all we, all of us, and grace for grace. God doesn't raise up people in the same family for one person to be the troublemaker and the other person is always swallowing. There should be grace for all who claim to be born again. God doesn't raise up uh, people, his children, and put them in the same church. And then one person is the divider when the other one is trying to unite. One person is a troublemaker. He's a stubborn one. And the other person is trying to unite. One person is loving. The other one doesn't care about love. One person is complaining, criticizing. The other person is just trying to edify. No, that's not God. But we acknowledge and recognize that in a big house, there are vessels of, of gold, of silver, and of wood. And of mud. You know? We also recognize that in a big house, there are, you know, tares that the devil has sown among the wheat. That there are trees that the father had not planted that are there. But the true children of God, grace is available and of his fullness have all we receive. And grace for grace. Grace for grace. Grace builds upon grace. Grace builds upon grace. And the, in the narration of the Gospels, the apostles are shown with limited grace. They abandoned the Lord when he was arrested. In the Acts of the Apostle, early chapters of the, of the book of Acts, we are told about great grace that was upon the brethren. Can somebody say praise the Lord? For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So if a man is in Christ, there is that grace. All sin and evil is rooted in the heart. A heart touched by grace has grace to eschew evil, to eschew sin. And that is God's perfect will for all his children. The heart is the root of all evil. But God has a promise for an heart that is struggling to be delivered from evil. God has a word for you. Can I read it to you? Amen. Praise the Lord. He says, and I will give them one heart. One heart. It's not different kind of heart within the family or in the church. And I'll give unto them one heart. Amen. Did I tell you where I was reading? Oh, well, you see it on the screen. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. The control room has my manuscript, so they, sh they can put it up even if I don't announce it. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give them an heart of flesh. That's the promise of God. Why is he focusing, focusing on the heart? Because that's the seat of all evil and all good. 
You see the picture Jesus presented of the great Christian. And then you understand exactly how we all ought to be. Nobody excusing babyhood. Nobody excusing childishness. But all being as God would have us be. And at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And said, verse 3 of Matthew 18, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receive it me. So you see, the person that is going around saying, well, look at you. You are letting this man make you boy, boy. And uh, then the, he then pro pokes up and provokes the ego in the other person. And the person has not read the Bible yet. Because if you read this, you know, you, you are to encourage people to be humble, to be submissive. Not warranting people to rebel. Little child, the picture of a Christian. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receive it me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. By the way, those are the words of Jesus Christ and they are serious. Because, and the reason is now threatening destruction. Is because he has tried to teach them this lesson. To teach the church this lesson earlier on. And they will not learn. Look at it. It says in Matthew chapter 11 verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. He put himself up. He said look at me. Follow me. I'm going to make you who you ought to be. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. And as they went, went along, he's almost getting to Calvary. They still have not learned. They're still struggling who is greater and so on and so forth. And so he picks up a child to place in front of them and he lost, bring the illustration and the teaching again to them. Remember? He told them in Matthew, Matthew 16, 24 about cross-carrying. That the Christian life may not necessarily be a, a bed of roses, but you should do everything to hang in there. Praise the Lord. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Forget yourself. Don't take too much to yourself. And that's the only way you can bear the cross after Christ. He has taught them this lesson more than once. He said in John chapter 13, over there in verse 15, he put himself up as an example, chapter 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Copy me. Copy me. And, and long after Christ was gone, the Spirit was still teaching the church to, full, to look unto Christ, to follow Christ, and all that. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren... Wherefore, what kind of brethren? Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. 
consider him. Consider what he will do in the situation that you are in. Consider Christ, how he will answer uh, the, uh, the way the, you, you are spoken to before you give an answer. Consider the action Jesus will take if he's in a bind, like in a situation that you are in. Consider Christ. Consider Christ. Why? He is the apostle and high priest of our profession. What is our profession? Christianity. We are Christians. Christ Jesus is our Lord. Can somebody say praise the Lord? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that's why Peter says, even if he calls for suffering, endure it. Put up with it. Amen. He says, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his step. Praise the Lord. And that brings us to the unique practice of the Christian. We've seen how to become one. We've seen that this, this grace is universal. It is given to all. We've seen that, you know, uh, the regeneration that uh, will make such a grace manifest is available to all. If your own is not like that, you don't have what you're supposed to have. If your own is not like that, you don't have what all in Christendom do have. If your own is not like that, you need to go back to Calvary and ask for the real thing. And ask for the genuine. Because counterfeit can kill. Counterfeit can kill. The man that on, on, who's killing unleashed riot all across the country. It was a $20 note counterfeit that warranted the police being called. Counterfeit kills. But you will not die like that. Not after Christ has spoken to you. That Titus passage, chapter 2, verse 11 said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Now point number two, unique practice of a Christian. We go to verse 12, teaching us. That grace teaches us a lesson. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Not when we get to heaven. No. Here. The grace teaches. If you say you are in college. Your language should reflect the things that you are learning in college. True or false. Your grammar cannot be fifth grade grammar. And you are in Ivy League, Ivy League college. Is that allowed? Answer me. You are told me. Is that allowed? No. That's not acceptable. Uh, those of you in school, tuning in, is that allowed? No. It says, teaching us, that grace teaches, teaching us that denying ungodliness, we just stop being ungodly people. We stop acting like ungodly people. We stop talking like ungodly people. We just throw away everything ungodly. Uh, denying ungodliness and worldly loss. You know, worldly loss. You know, loss drives us to overspend. Look at your credit card. You don't even have money to make minimum payment. That's, that's the product of loss. Uh, you know, look at the expense we stretch ourselves to the point that we use the 90% of our income that God gives to us to use and cross over to use the 10% that, is, that belongs to God. And we don't think that there's anything wrong with that. We just think, cool. <laughs> the Lord opened the eyes of all. Amen? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live how? Soberly. Humbly, quiet people, humble people, meek. 
righteously, holily, godly, godly. In this present world, you are brought into the kingdom by grace. You need the same grace to sustain you in the kingdom. Have you met a Christian lately? Has anybody here met a Christian lately? Amen? That's you, right? Yes. That should be you. That should be you. That you were not even thinking about it, and then somebody just commented, you are a Christian. You are a Christian. You are a Christian. If you have met a Christian, he is a student and disciple of Jesus Christ. He studies Christ. He follows Christ. He calls Christ master. He calls Christ rabbi. Rabboni. We are taught by grace like I read to you in Matthew, like I read to you, I've read verse 12 to you, and uh, that grace, let's go back to that Psalm 1. It's going to be Titus, and Psalm 1, Titus 2 and Psalm 1. Now, this time, verse 2. Look at this person. He has abandoned sin. He has left sin, and so on and so forth. Look at verse 2. Let's read it together. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate. He prays in the word. How often? Day and night. Praise the Lord. That's how unique this person is. And when you're like that, the Lord himself will be noticing you, hearing and answering your prayer. He's righteous and not just religious. Because he understands that Jesus has already said that except your righteousness shall exceed that of the Pharisees. And you cannot be more religious than the Pharisees. Man, those people were religious to the core. Religious to the point that they killed the Messiah. And so, unless your righteousness exceeds their own, that was only religion. You have no chance making it. The Christian life must spell out the word gospel. You came in by the preaching of the gospel. You came in in response to the preaching of the gospel. That gospel must be visible in your life. How do you spell it? G. For grace. G for growth in grace. Not gloom, no gloom. Not greed. Avarice, running after everything in the world. The grace, the grace that brought salvation has appeared unto all men. That grace stays with you. G for grace. Not seeking greatness. G for godly. Godliness with contentment is a great gain. G for godliness with contentment. The world is godless. The world know not God. The Ephesian uh, believers have to be reminded. Don't follow that uh, Diana people. They do that in order to enrich themselves. But you've been bought with the price. Come out. There's no God in the world. Look at it. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12. That at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise. 
covenants, plural, of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes, who were, ye who sometimes were far off, far off, are made nigh, are brought near by the blood of Christ. G for godly. G for good works. Good works, verse 10, Ephesians 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Notice that in Christ again there. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Praise the Lord. That we should do what? That we should walk in them. Praise the Lord. G for good works. The new man, spiritual, not old man, that is canal. The, the, the new man is full of good works. There is a way the new man lives that you can tell is not an old man. When you see the little child that Christ showed you in chapter 18 of the Gospel of Matthew, can you mistake him with Methuselah in Genesis 969 years? Can you mistake the two? Answer me. Does an old man phenotypically look like a child? They may be childish. That's a different story. But do they phenotypically, physically look like a child? Answer me. No. There's a difference. The gray hair betrays them. Doesn't it? The bald head betrays them. Doesn't it? You know? Uh, joking with a little... Uh, the, a child, four years and all that. And uh, how old are you? I'm four. I said, wow, you're too old. He said, what about you? I said, I'm three. He said, you? <laughs> you three? <laughs> so even the little child knows the difference. Praise the Lord. Amen. The new man, the new man has to be different, different. Ephesians 4, 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the former lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created, in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, because there are things that you must indicate that you object to that. There are things that you must frown, uh, frown at, but don't let anger lead you to sin. Don't let anger carry you past the line drawn by the Holy Spirit into the territory of Satan. Be angry and sin not. Let not, uh, at the time you are planning revenge, at the time you are acting in order to show the person that you are angry and you are doing something to hurt that person at that time, be, be careful, you may have crossed the line already. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. Christians shouldn't steal now. Should they? No. But rather let him labor, walking with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that, but that which is good to the, use, to the use of a divine, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If a believer happens to say something that maybe an unbeliever or another believer says, that's a corrupt communication. Why, 
I, I don't know Christians talk like that. Oh, brother, oh, sister, why did you say that? That looks like you're flirting. The believer, so-called, if you're a real believer, you don't get angry. Just repent and apologize directly to the person. Don't you see, even unbelievers, sometimes if they know that you're a Christian, you're a pastor, sometimes they use some careless words, they say, excuse my language. If sinners will do that, and it is the one that claims to be a Christian, you can't apologize, just get angry. They say that to me, I'm going to take action. <laughs> he probably did it. She probably did it. He probably sinning. But the grace of God will abound upon all of us in Jesus' name. It says, because what you do should be geared to minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. How many malice? And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake had forgiven you. Have you been forgiven? I'm asking, have you been forgiven? Freely ye have received, freely give. Share it. Amen? I'm asking again, have you been forgiven? Freely ye have received, freely share it. Amen? Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us and offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become its sins, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Amen. For this you know that no monger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Sometimes you don't know the manifestation of the wrath of God. But if you, when you pay attention to the spirit... And you see that God permits some pestilence on the land that also affects you, the way you live. You know, because you live among the children of disobedience, that wrath is being manifested around you. It doesn't touch you, but you're feeling the repercussions of it. Think about it. Because God needed to destroy Sodom, Lot and his family had to relocate. They left their nice house. And whatever they had that prompted the wife to look back, they relocated, they moved somewhere else. You need to understand that though that wrath is visiting somewhere, somebody else, the Lord has you there. You have a duty to stem that wrath in prayer, in service, in soul winning, in everything. Anyway, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't be a disobedient person. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You see that? You are left one kingdom to the other. You can't be between the two kingdoms. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather do what? Do what to them? Reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Praise the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 9, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Christians that lie are not Christians. You can't find the gospel in them, even if you turn on the light of a stadium. 
and have put on the new man, verse 10, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Praise the Lord. In Genesis, what did God say? How did God say he was going to create man? He was going to create man in his own image. After salvation, that image is restored. And so, even though you are accustomed to how flesh does things, you consciously, as you read your Bible every day, learn to practice and walk against the tune of the flesh. And the Lord will be helping his children in Jesus' name. The first letter in the word gospel is what? Is G. The second letter is what? Is O. Obedience. Obedience. Obedience to God. If you're obedient to God, every man will know that you obey God. Oh Lord, help us. We don't want people in the call to be more obedient to Satan than we do than we are to you. Would that be respectful to God? That people in false religion, Jehovah Witness, are more obedient to their this thing than the real Christian. That mention any of these other major four religions, they hold true to tight. Think about it. Just think about that. Just think about that. And so you need to really uh, pay close attention. You know, obedience to God is supersedes everything else. Observe to do according to all that is written. Joshua was counseled in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. And that is the secret to success. And that's the secret to prosperity. Observe to do all that is written in the book of the law. He says in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19. You know, talking about obedience. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19. That if ye be willing and, tell me, willing and uh, obedient, what will happen? Uh -huh. So, the good of the land is not available to the one that compromises. The good of the land is not available to the one that is disobedient. It is the obedient one that is entitled to the good of the land. And uh, Saul had to learn the hard way that disobedience is expensive. Obedience is cheaper than disobedience. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 22, uh, you know, has the Lord a great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices? Imagine the cost of all those burnt offerings, uh, burnt offerings and sacrifices. They're expensive. And all Saul needed to do was just wait there until Samuel shows up. And all Saul needed to do was just do exactly as God has said he should do to the Amalekites. Just think about that. And it cost him his throne. We will turn and disobedience will not cost us eternity. Amen? You see, when you're obedient to God, you are walking in his will. An obedient person finds out God's will for his life. He finds it out to do it. Not just to find out and talk about it. The Lord Jesus Christ, the psalmist says of him and of me and you. In the volume of the book, it is written, Psalm 40. It is written in the volume of the book. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Total surrendering, uh, surrendering to the will of God. They ask the Lord Jesus Christ, your mother and your siblings are out there. They want to talk to you. And uh, Jesus pointed to his disciples. And concluded that illustration by saying, it is the person that is doing the will of my Father in heaven that really has relationship with me. That's why we are saying that obedience is a gospel mark in your soul. 
that says, indeed, you are a Christian, different from the world. His will will be done in your life. Amen? Obe o for obedience, O for overcomer. And he that overcometh shall inherit how many things? Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 7. And he that overcometh shall inherit how many things? All things. All things. And God says, I will be his God. Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. The next letter on the, on the gospel is S. S for sanctification. To be sanctified is not just coming to church and ask, oh Lord, sanctify me. Make up your mind. Deal with the first step, which is separation from the world. If you don't deal with the first step, how are you going to be sanctified? Separation from the world is still a Christian practice. It's still a unique practice of a Christian. That we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Christians are not of the world, though in the world. Christians are not allowed to be of the world. Jesus took time to pray concerning that. John chapter 17. Turn with me. The Gospel of John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. If Jesus is not praying for them to live like Christians until they become Christians, how can they, how can any carnal person ever find grace to live the way God wants us to live? I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are, they are thine. If the grace of God is not available in the world, and you are worldly, you cannot find grace for sanctification, for separation from it. Because you love it, you appreciate it. In verse 14, it says in verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. If the world loves you, check up your salvation. I've given them thy word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Think about that. Jesus is saying that the Christian is on the side that he is. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Notice it deals with the separation from the world before praying for sanctification on them. On us. On me and you. And Christ's prayer will be answered in our lives in Jesus' name. S for sanctification, S to be spirit-led, spirit walk in the spirit. If any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He is none of his. If any man, is that not what the scripture teaches? Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He is not. He doesn't belong to God. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are 
the sons of God. We're still talking about the Christian difference. Is that different? That the difference is there in your life, in your family? Can your husband say? Can your wife say? Can the children say? As for surrendered life, you hear Paul say, crying out, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But the life that I live now in the flesh, I live by the power, by the grace, by the conformity, by the uh, uh, support, by the uh, 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 spirit of God that is enabling me, the life that I now live, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As for salt, salt cleanses and salt preserves and salt gives flavor. Think about it. Matthew 5, 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. Now, if you are salt... Let's just start from the nuclear family. You make life have flavor in the family. You make life sweet in the family. You make life comfortable in the family. You know, like a father, sometimes the legs are hurting. The back is hurting. The single mother, sometimes the pounding headache that has gone on for so long, they now call her that headache, my migraine. I don't mean mine, I mean that's what they say. I don't have migraine. And so, they, it, regardless of all that headache, regardless of all those pain, they go out to labor in order to bring resource home to care for the people at home. Salt. They cleanse the Preserve. Salt would not let anything go sour, go bad, putrefied. Salt adds flavor. You couldn't eat a lot of food without salt in it. I mean, you can eat your, you know, uh, what is it you eat? Okay, yeah, somebody said pande yam over there. I didn't know you add salt on that one. Then they just put flour. Oh, you mean the soup? Anyway, salt brings the flavor. And you know, with salt, while it's doing its work, it disappears. A salt that you can see in the food after finished product, that food is dangerous to eat. It's either it is sand. Or there's too much salt that will give you high blood pressure. So no, seriously, stop it. But real salt disappears inside that food. It gets into the mingling inside it. And when you find a church with believers that are like salt, they are into, they are in touch with everything. Good, good, good. They do good here, good there, good there, good there. They are not talking about the ones that are just looking for informants. And they get close to this in order to get information about that. And they get close to that in order to get information. You know, they come to church, and the first thing they find out, because they came here and overstayed their visa, the first thing they find out is which lawyer in the church can file for green card. And as soon as they get their green card, they don't know that lawyer anymore. They, find, they want to buy a house. They find out. And it's not because they don't have money to pay somebody outside. They just want cheap service or free service. You know? And if you see how they will bad mouth that profession, uh, that professional that is trying to help them, whether real estate or lawyer or doctor and so on and so forth, you would say, you will wonder, wow, that one too is a Christian. Salt. Will not do that. Salt brings up the better flavor. Salt brings out the expected flavor. We will season one another. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
I say praise the Lord. And uh, then S for service. Service to Christ. And this one comes with honor. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 12 verse 26. He says, if any man serve me, if any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. That honor is waiting for you. And we all get it in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. What's the next letter after S? Hello? The gospel, the word gospel. We've done G, we've done O, we've done S. What's the next letter? Letter P. P for power. Is the power of God that made you a son. As many as received to them gave you power to become the sons of God. John 1, 12. P for power. P for, for uh, uh, power of the son that flows through you. The power that made you is available to flow through you. P for purity. P for perfection. Be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. You know, P for perfection. P for provision. All the provisions of God are available for the believer. You know that for a fact. You know that for sure. P for provision. P for promises. It's unto us that is, that is given exceeding great and precious promises. P for promises. P for priesthood. P for priesthood. I'll address just one. P for power. It says in Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Behold, I give unto you what? Power. Behold, I give unto you power. What are you going to do with this power? Because you are still in the world, even though you are not of the world. But even though Satan knows who you are, sometimes serpents are thrown your way. Scorpions are thrown your way. And all kinds of things to bite and to, bite, to bark, dogs to bite, to sting, and so on and so forth. But you are equipped to deal with all of that. Did you hear what I said? I said you are equipped to deal with all of that. Behold, I give unto you power to trade on serpents and scorpions. And over how many? All the power of the enemy. And uh, tell me, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Amen? E for evangelist. The church mistakenly thinks that the room for an evangelist is only limited to one or two in the church. So, brother, so, 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 should go win souls. And what are you going to do? She says, so, 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 should go win souls. And what will you do? No, this office, whosoever man. Because, you see, the gift of the spirit is available for every member of the body, isn't it? Hello? Isn't it? Praise the Lord. Now, when you are eating, I know all of, most of you use cutleries now, but for some of you that don't use cutlery, when you are eating, because when you use cutlery, all your five fingers are involved, isn't it? Do you take out three fingers and say, Knife or fork, you only, you, you only need two fingers to hold it. Is that what you do? No. All five fingers are involved. But the person that is eating food with the hand, you know, he may say, well, I don't need my fourth and fifth finger. I just need my uh, 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 three fingers to make the bolus of the fufu. Would that be right? So you only wash the three fingers because those are the only fingers you're going to use to eat. Uh, by, by the way, don't do it during pandemic because that's not hygienic enough. What I'm trying to say is that all your five fingers are involved. Amen? Praise the Lord. The Lord give us wisdom. And so we cannot say, well, 
The thumb can go and win souls. Well, let the thumb take the, the, the fifth finger. And what happens to the second, the third, and the fourth finger? Everybody's supposed to be involved, and we'll all be involved in Jesus' name. Amen? But, uh, and, uh, and then, you uh, see, this evangelist, uh, 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 Philip became one. The church made him a deacon, but God made, made him an evangelist. And so was Paul. And Paul, immediately after getting saved, started to preach. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. E for evangelists, E for eternal rest. Eternity is always in focus at all times for the children of God. Jesus said, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. That the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Praise the Lord. L for light. Walk in the light. God is light. Jesus Christ is light. You are light in the world which is in darkness. Let your light so shine that the world may glorify your Father. Amen? You are the light of the world. Let your light shine. If you are in Christ, you have the real light. Let your light shine. L for light. L for love. Walk in love. This, you know, season all your actions and utterance with love. Read that First Corinthians 13 over and over and over for yourself. You are going to find inside that chapter that love endures suffering. Love endures things the canal cannot endure. You see, the life of grace and the reason the Lord wants us, gives us the grace, is because there are things he's going to allow in our lives that you're going to need grace. He doesn't tell unbelievers out there on the street, if your enemy, your enemy hurt you, return good. Can he talk like that to a drug addict? Can he talk like that to a gangster? No. It is the person with grace that he says, love your enemy, pray for your enemy. Return good for any evil you get. And so, it's not just something you just idle about. L for love and will love as the Lord has taught us in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the life that the apostle is asking us to behold all things are become new. Is this your testimony? Is that what the Lord knows about you? As we try to round up now, and we look at the unequivocal promises, if the grace of God has taught you any lesson, like Titus was being taught, Paul saying to Titus, for, by the, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. The blessed promises. The blessed hope of heaven. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, not some iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of what kind of work? Good works. These things he commands me to speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee, no man in despising me. They all love me. Praise the Lord. These are the blessings. There are the blessings in this life for all Christians from God who live godly. The godly will never perish. You know that. The righteous is 
held very tenderly close to God. And there are blessings for them in this life and much more in the world to come. Greater blessings await us in eternity than in this life. But even in this life, it is grace that will see us through to eternity for us to inherit that blessing. And you still remember the counsel of Jesus Christ? He says, even, if, even when we end up with great ministry success, he says, in this rejoice not. Because you say, well, these are spiritual things as we are succeeding on. Yes, but even with that, don't get too excited. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's the source of our joy. That's the source of our joy. Why? Because here on earth, we are back to Psalm 1. Now, our third point speaks on verse 3. While here on earth, we are, we are, since we have been meditating and delighting in the word of the Lord, the fruit will begin to show, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The obedient people. The gospel is showing in our lives. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The whole family is submissive to Christ. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's for me. That's for you. I agree with you in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord will bless you and keep you for me. The Lord will prosper you and just fulfill my joy, the joy of my heart on your behalf in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, it takes us taking the word of God seriously. It says in Deuteronomy 29 verse 9, Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. Amen? Some of us, our blessing has been waiting at the door. I don't know when you're going to open the door. But I pray you, you open not only the door, but your mouth. He says in Psalm 81, before we, we pray, so that you have opportunity to open your mouth wide. He says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, which saved thee. Open thy mouth wide. Open thy mouth wide. Open thy mouth wide. And the Lord says, I will fill it. Praise the Lord. Does God lie? Can God lie? Will he do it? Of course, yes, he will do it. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Success, greater success, glorious success will attend the efforts of this ministry, this church, in this city, in this nation, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Where are those people that are planted? You are sure the Lord himself has planted you. You are certain the Lord himself has planted you. If you are not sure, don't put up your hand. There's no, there's no argument about it. Just leave your hand down. You know, and whoever brought you, whoever planted you, <laughs> when we say, let the Lord uproot the tree, he didn't plant <laughs> it will take place. It will take place. No, seriously, we're not. Uh, we're we're being serious now. We're really, really talking serious stuff now, because you see the real children of God. This blessing. I'm going to read it again because it will stick in your life. It will follow you home. This one, Satan will not steal it away. In the name of Jesus Christ, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord 
is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together. Let's rise up. And just talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up. And uh, examine ourselves in the light of the word of God. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. And ask the Lord. Shine that light deeper to all the recesses of my heart. Let no hypocrisy hide in any corner. Let not my heart deceive me. The scripture has already spoken in that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Only the spirit of God with the light of the word of God can show the spot, the wrinkle, the defilement, the shame, the dirt that is there. And the Lord is waiting to take it away so that in that family you will become the salt. Without you, they have no flavor. Without you, it's like they don't feel preserved. They feel something is missing. Without you, It's like the, the, there's corruption set in. Without you, everything is dirty. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, you can see it. All things have become new. Make up your mind. They will know you as a Christian in the church. They will know you as a Christian at home. They will know you as a Christian in the place of work. They will know you as a Christian in college. They will know you as a Christian in high school. They will know you as a Christian in the great school. They will know you as a Christian in the playground. They will know you as a Christian in the market. They will know you as a Christian everywhere you go. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has shown us the universal picture of a Christian. Humble as a child. Honest as a child. Teachable as a child. Just imitating Christ. Copying the Lord. That's how children copy. They keep copying until they understand what they are copying. The Lord has shown us the unique practice of a Christian. You can see the gospel in their life. You know, the godliness is there. The obedience is there. The sanctification the holiness is there. The separation from the world and all everything else, the salt, is there. They are spirit-led. And the power is there in their life. The promises are being fulfilled in their life. The perfection, the provision, the priesthood. The priesthood, the priesthood. They are, they are inter interceding. They stand between the family and the throne of God. The fathers that know how to pray. The mothers that know how to pray. They can hold sway at the throne of grace and they daily go boldly to the throne of grace. The power is there. The evangelist is there. The soul winning, the light is there. The, the gospel can be seen in your life. And if the gospel is seen in your life, the promises will not disappear from your life. All oh, to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. 
I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Oh. Have you lived fully, 100% to him? Leaving nothing out? Forget the ego. Forget if they belittle you. Forget if they mock you. They did worse to Christ. Forget any excuse. Crucify the flesh. Mortify the flesh. Put off that rationalization. Put away. Put it away. It's hindering you. Surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Just ask the Lord for grace for that separation from the world. In the West, United States or Europe, this is the, the idol of the world. Worldliness. Idolatrous. Just tell the Lord, he will give you grace and take the appetite away. That you look at those things you used to pursue and they will look, they will look stale and mundane. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord. I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. The Lord will give us love that is perfect. Perfect in our families, perfect in the church, perfect in every life in the name of Jesus Christ. All to Jesus I surrender now. I create them. Oh, the joy of full Salvation, glory, glory to his name. I surrender. I surrender. All to thee, my I surrender all. Everlasting Father, we bless your name for this day. We thank you for wonderful instruction to our hearts, to our household, to our home, 
and to the house of God. We ask, O oh God, that your word will never depreciate in value in our lives in Jesus' name. Father, bless your people, O oh God. Wash us clean in your presence. Fill us full with your spirit. Empower us to live, to glorify your name in the name of Jesus Christ. Let the gospel of Christ be the fruit of our lives everywhere we go. Grant unto us, Lord, the grace to represent you completely, perfectly, that Father angels will sing Hosanna to thy holy name in Jesus' name. You say we are lights in the world. Father, let others see Jesus through us. You say we are the salt of the earth. Father, oh God, let this place, this nation, United States of America, receive good flavor from our lives in Jesus' name. Arise, oh God, Lord, and lift up your church and use your church to honor thy glorious name in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we bless your name, oh God. And I pray. For any of our families that are struggling at this time, Lord, I'm asking, oh God, that thy power will come through to heal, that your power will come through to deliver, that your power will come through to raise the dead in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for hitherto you've answered us, Lord. Continue to keep, oh God, this pandemic away from your people. Even, Father, our brethren that are in the front line as healthcare workers, as people being brought in contact with other people, whether in the grocery store or in some other settings of human labor. Father, I'm asking, oh God, that your glory will be present with them because your word has already spoken concerning us. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Amen? They will take up serpent. We we'll just take those poisonous things and throw them away in the name of Jesus Christ. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And that sick, if it includes them, oh God, I pray, their hand will heal them in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you and I bless your name, oh God, this day. Lord, we remember our children in colleges. And we, and we hear what is going on in all these schools. Father, preserve them. Father, single them out for your favor. Father, make them the head and not the tail in the name of the Lord. We cover them with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether in college, university, high school, or great school, in the name of Jesus Christ. And dear Lord, you see how the pandemic is affecting your work, affecting your church. Lord, hurry and set it aside. Let your church go forward in the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you and we bless your name, O oh God. In Jesus' name I have prayed. And the people of God say... Amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated for a moment. I just have one or two announcements. And, um, and then our brother will come and round up the service. Uh, the first thing is our Bible study. Um, I don't know. How many of you get my email? I didn't come to the attachment yet. What's your problem? Okay. How many people have gotten a, a Bible study outline the last two weeks? You got it, got it, got it. So, so I don't have to explain the attachment. Because the attachment was supposed to be the Bible study outline. Uh, we have resumed uh, making, um, when I say we, I mean I'm part I agree with Lagos. Uh, outline for the Bible study. Um, if we print it out for you, you will only get it after the Bible study. Because it is out like on Monday or late Sunday for the Monday Bible study in Lagos. So by which time you would have, we would have finished the Sunday service. And that's why we are engaging to... Email it to you. So we'll forward them to you as soon as we get them. Please, and I'm sure you have already observed that, the Bible references that are in the outline, the GS does not read all of them. They are there for your study. 
Did you notice that yet? Amen? So please, make good use of it. And as the Lord, the Lord continues to supply us, uh, we'll continue to supply you. Amen? Praise the Lord. And the, the, the global headquarters has resumed, has asked local churches to resume the Friday revival service. Um, because of the peculiar situation in New York, uh, until uh, Dr. Okunkwa informs us otherwise, uh, uh, Dr. Emem Okunkwa, I don't know many doctors there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Where's my name? She's, she's walking today? Okay. Um, until we hear from her of the uh, concerning the restrictions, we will still do the um, uh, Friday revival service and continue with the Bible study uh, virtually. Uh, just that it's going to be preached locally. Praise the Lord. And uh, we got caught because somebody forgot to send me the memo during the week. That's why you listen to the same message from previous week on Friday uh, because we got caught. And when I called Lagos, they said, ah, they didn't send you the, <laughs> the memo. I said, what, say what memo? <laughs> he is supposed to preach. Okay. So uh, we are making a uh, correction to that. And so let's wake up. Let all the hands that hang down uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, be put up. And the Lord, the church is still marching on. Amen. We are still observing mask wearing. For those of you, for those of you that were watching our brethren in Isolo yesterday with their chin guard. <laughs> they had a ch their sh shin guard on. A chin guard on, rather. Uh, shin, chin. Yeah. Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, we'll still sort that out later. But in New York, uh, you know what they expect us. So we just kindly, humbly follow because our breakthrough is very near. No, seriously. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Amen. Pastor Manoko. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please let us rise up.